Hi, everyone. I hope you're here because you like literature, because we're going to read a lot of it. This course is one of the two hardest courses that I teach. The other one is Shakespeare. And the reason is the same, because we're going to be reading lots of old timey stuff using old timey English. And using concepts that you might not be familiar with. And that's why this course is an elective. You can elect, that is, choose whether you want to take it or not. So let's go over the Moodle website so that you know the resources that you have. Uh, then I will introduce the idea of the course and then uh, pass out the first handout and introduce the first thing that we're going to read. OK, so if you need to contact me, this is my email. If you for some reason need to join the Teams class and you're not already a member, you can add yourself using this code. Here is the syllabus. Let's take a look. Oh, not that one. Sorry. This one syllabus. Ta -da. OK, so week one introduction. I'm doing that right now. Weeks two to four, we're going to be reading a seven, uh, yeah, seventeenth century English Renaissance play by somebody who was born just a few decades after Shakespeare. So the language will be very similar. You know, for a course called British Important Writers Works, I should be teaching Shakespeare. He's like the most important British writer. But you know, I'm already teaching another Shakespeare class. If you want to learn about Shakespeare, you can take that class. Here, we're going to use the opportunity to read something that is not by Shakespeare. Uh, so we're going to spend three weeks to read one play. Then weeks five, six, and eight is something else entirely. Um, we're going to be reading selections from the most important epic poem of British literature, Paradise Lost. The whole thing is like 12,000 lines, but we're not going to read 12,000 lines. We're going to read 500 lines. Um, and it's not going to be like large. There, there will be like one or two large sections, but the rest will be uh, shorter selections that I believe are the more important parts to know about. The whole thing is 12 books, Sir Drin. Uh, so we're going to be reading a little bit from most books. We're going to skip like book five and book six, some of the boring stuff. Um, and this can be harder than the play. This was published in the late 17th century. So like about 70 years after the play, the language should be easier a little bit, right? Problem is the author of Paradise Lost, John Milton, uh, he knew that he was writing an epic poem and he thought for epic poetry, I need to use epic English. So he decided to use an older, more difficult kind of English. Um, so when I introduce this, I will show you some tricks you can use to try to make sense of things. Um, and we'll talk about that more in week four. Week seven, no class. Uh, don't come to class. If you come to class, I will not be here. Week Eight will also be when I introduce the midterm exam. In this class, you will have a midterm and a final. These two exams are both open book, open ended question, essay questions um, on Moodle, and you will have one week to finish the exam at home. If you're here from Introduction to British Literature, these exams will be slightly different from last semester. Last semester, the question was, read this, 
this is from this period. How can you tell? What is the evidence? In this class, we're only reading three things, so the questions will be about what we read. Um, every week I will throw up five discussion questions about that week's assigned reading. They will all be open ended questions uh, and they will be about like uh, details from the stories or details about the language or ideas about what's going on. The midterm and final exams will have the same kind of questions, just bigger because it's about the whole thing, not just one week. So again, there's no standard right or wrong answer. There are better or worse answers, um, but you will get to decide what your answer is. So that's the first half of the semester. Then week nine, we will begin the second unit and it will go for the rest of the semester. Persuasion is a novel by Jane Austen. We're going to read the whole thing. Uh, the good news is it is Jane Austen's shortest novel. Uh, and the better news is that week 10, I will show you the movie version. And the movie version, you know, it's never exactly the same as the book, but this movie is quite close. So if you forget something or you need to find something in the novel, you can use the movie to help you. But you cannot use the movie on the final exam. So week nine, uh, I'm just going to introduce the novel. I will guide you th reading through like the first chapter, maybe the first two chapters. Uh, week 10, we watch the movie, and then after that, every week you will read four chapters. Now, again, four chapters, so many, but if you actually look at the handout, four chapters is like two pages. Oh, sorry, one chapter is like two pages. So it's not that bad. Um, it, it gets slightly worse near the middle, but you don't have to worry about that for now. Uh, and then because this semester we don't have a uh, coordinated midterm exam or a coordinated final exam. I had two extra weeks. Um, so week 17, we're going to read a paper, an academic paper about the novel. Uh, and then I will introduce the final exam and week 18, we're just going to watch a random movie uh, to relax. So that's what we're going to be doing this semester. You may have noticed that I have a big stack of handouts in front of me. So in the past, uh, if I wanted to make handouts, what I would do was I'd prepare the file and then I'd fill out an application form and I'd send it to the school's printing office and the printing office would give me a stack of handouts in about one week's time. But this semester, the guy in charge of the printing office retired and the school decided not to hire a replacement. So this semester, if I want to make handouts, I have to prepare the file. I have to take the file to the printing office. I have to make the copies and I have to carry everything back. So um, this is just to say that if you are fine with the PDF and you don't really need a paper copy. Please tell me. Um, it will save me like 100 pages. Um, but of course, studies show that you learn better when you take physical paper notes. Um, so if you do want a copy, uh, don't worry about it. It's my job to help you learn. OK. Uh, oh, also, I mentioned this here because in the past the school said uh, every handout has to be 50 pages or less. But now there's no guy over there counting pages. So I can make a 100 page handout if I want to. Um, so like in the past, I would split persuasion into two halves. First 12 chapters, second 12 chapters. In fact, Jane Austen did the same thing. When Persuasion was first published, it was published in two volumes, chapters one to 12 and then 
volume 2, chapters 1 to 12, which today we call chapters 13 to 24. Um, so it makes a kind of sense. But if you, I, I, you know what, I'll ask you. You can think about this. Do you want to have two handouts with 50 pages each? Or do you want to have one handout of 100 pages? Um, by pages, like I, I will combine pages. So one page of the handout will be two pages from the novel. And then you flip to the other side, it will be another two pages. So when I say 100 pages, uh, what I mean is 50 pieces of paper. So 25 pieces of paper or 50 pieces of paper. Um, and it will be stapled. Because if you know, if I don't staple it for you and the wind blows through the classroom, you will lose your novel forever. Uh, so they will be stapled. So I'll ask you later. You can think about it. Do you want one big handout or two smaller handouts? OK, and then the grading. This semester, the grading is midterm exam 40%, final exam 40%, and attendance 20%. Attendance works like this. If you are absent and you do not take leave, I will take away from 20 points, I will take away three points. If you use 100%, out of 100% daily grade, if you don't come to class and you don't take leave, I will take away 15 points. Now, these numbers were very carefully chosen. The midterm and final exams are, as I said, open ended. You can answer however you want, but there are some rules. If your answer does not follow the rules, uh, you will only get half of the score. So think about this. If you take the midterm and you don't follow the rules, you get 20 points. If you take the final and you still don't follow the rules, you get another 20 points. At this point, how much more do you need to pass? 20. So if you're not sure that you will do well on the exams, you should come to class. OK, that's the syllabus. Do you have questions? OK, let's decide. Do you want one big handout or two smaller handouts? Uh, if you want one big handout, please raise your hand. If you want two smaller handouts, please raise your hand. If you're fine with the PDF and you don't need paper, please raise your hand. OK, so it's two to one, so we're going to have one big handout. Thank you all for not voting. OK, so that's the syllabus. Next, class emails. If I need to tell you something and it cannot wait for the next class, I will write a class email. This email will go to um, if you have set a personal email account on the student information system. It will go to your personal email account. If you did not set a personal email account, it will go to your school email account. I know that some of you don't check your school email every day. In fact, <laughs> I've been spending a week trying to contact a student and they have not been responding to me, so I know this. Uh, so if I do write an email to the whole class, I will change the title of this thing. I will add the date and I will add the title of the latest message so that you know that there is a new message you should know about. Next thing, you will notice that I'm actually recording this lecture. Uh, and uh, after each week, I will take the recording and I will upload it to YouTube. And the reason I upload it to YouTube is because YouTube the next day will produce a transcript uh, of English videos. So it only work if I teach in English. Um, and those transcripts you can search. So like if you if you missed something and you need to rewatch it, you don't have to watch all two hours. You can open the transcript, search for the keyword you want, 
click and jump to that part in the video. And uh, I recorded a short video to show you how that works. Uh, so if you need to learn how to do that, you can watch that. Here is where I will record your attendance grade. You can't see this. I have hidden this from you. So th this is the basic information you will need. Uh, the first unit introduction, I'm doing that right now. I have only added one more thing. If you are still confused why we are studying literature in an applied English department, uh, you can take a look at this Chinese essay about why literature can be important. OK, and then uh, starting, I guess, later today, if we have time, we're going to have time. I'm almost done. Uh, I'll guide you through. I'll introduce the play and I'll guide you through reading like the first scene, the first two scenes. As I said, every week we will have a discussion. I have already written the discussion questions and the, you know, I've posted them here. So in fact, you can use these discussion questions as a study guide. I only ask about things that I think are interesting or important. So if you're kind of confused or lost or stuck, you can take a look at these questions and maybe they will help you think about uh, what's going on in the text. Uh, OK, and then the next unit, Paradise Lost, three weeks. Uh, and then this is the second half. This is the movie. You can't see this, but I will show this to you after we finish watching the movie. In case you are not able to make it to class, you can still have the chance to watch the movie. Now, uh, this is a OneDrive folder. Inside the folder, there are two files, a movie file and a subtitles file. Zimu. The subtitles were edited by myself. I found subtitles online. There were terrible subtitles. So I literally like went through the subtitles line by line following the movie and I corrected the subtitles just for you. And also for like the last year's class and two years ago's class, but like for you guys. Um, so some people don't know how to add subtitles to a movie file. If you use a Windows computer, I recorded a short video teaching you how to do that. If you use an Apple computer, good luck, no idea. Um, but if you use a Windows computer, here's the thing. If you use like Windows 10, Windows 11, the default video player cannot add subtitles. So the first part of this video is showing you how to download another video player. Uh, and then that video player, you can then add subtitles. OK, and then uh, same thing, right? The text, the discussion questions, and then this is the academic paper. It's actually a, a selection from her book on Jane Austen. Uh, it's not very long, it's like eight pages. Uh, and then the discussion questions on that paper. Uh, here we have the exams. These are the exam rules there. If you took a uh, class with me last semester, basically the same rules. I will uh, go over them with you when I introduce the exams. Midterm, final, the questions are all ready. You just can't see them yet. So infuriating. OK, and then the last part uh, in the past, I called this bonus. This semester I decided to change things. Uh, extra credit, there are two different kinds. If you don't think you're going to pass, do this one, right? It's called last chance, pretty obvious. Um, and if I think you do a good job, I will give you exactly 60. Or if you're a graduate student, 70 because graduate students need 70 to pass. This is another open ended essay question. I'm not going to tell you what the question is. You will find out if you need to use it. If you think you are going to pass and you just want a higher grade, 
then you get the more traditional uh, bonus essay assignment. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, if you have done this before, tell me and I will give you a new text. Right? If you've already used this and you successfully got a higher score, I will give you another thing. If you do the same thing again, it will not count. Uh, and because this uh, extra credit assignment will count words, 1000 English, 2000 Chinese, or any other language, and I use Google Translate to turn it into 1000 English, it counts words, so you should be aware of the Google Docs error. If you use Google Docs to write the assignment, and then you turn it into a word file. This might happen. Can you see what's wrong? What the error is? Yeah, it's counting wrong. Look, how many words is this? Two words, but here it says five words. What's going on? Well, the computer thinks that each letter is a word. So it's five letters, but the computer says five words. Um, so how do you know if you have run into this problem? Look at this. This line begins with one S. That's not a word. The next line, you have the second half of this word. Again, like random line breaks. And the reason this happens is, again, the computer thinks that each letter is a word. So of course, it doesn't matter whether it's a complete word or not. A computer doesn't care. So if you see random line breaks like that, then you may have a problem. Now, I am pretty good at using Microsoft Word, but I have not been able to solve this problem. So if you do see this problem, there's only one thing you can do. Copy open a different software, not Microsoft Word. Paste it there and then copy again, open a new Microsoft Word file and then paste it in and it will solve the problem. But there's no like settings you can use to, to solve this. Uh, the best idea is, you know, um, don't use the, the, what's it called? The function to change Google Docs into Microsoft Word. If you use Google Docs, copy the whole thing and then paste it into Microsoft Word. OK, that is the Moodle web page. Questions? If you've taken my classes before, this should look very familiar. OK, so uh, th that's the technical stuff. Now let's talk about the actual course. Here's the thing. I know that we're going to be reading some very hard stuff. When I told a professor friend of mine, like one of my old professors, I was chatting with him and I mentioned, oh, and now I'm teaching like Shakespeare and like uh, Tis Pity, She's a Whore, Paradise Lost. And he said, uh, are you using a student text? And I say, oh, no, I'm using the original text. And he said, why are you doing that? Not even American universities are doing that anymore. Um, and the reason I'm asking you to read the hard stuff is because, um, you know, sometimes you will hear teachers say, oh, I want you to have fun when you learn. I want learning to be fun. It doesn't work. Learning is hard. It's supposed to be hard. When you learn, you're exercising your brain. Your brain is a muscle. When you go to the gym, and you exercise your arms and your legs. That hurts. When you exercise your brain, it hurts. Um, if you've ever tried to make sense of something very hard and your head starts to hurt and you feel sleepy and it's, it's hard to know what's going on, that's normal. That's like picking up something that's too heavy for you. Uh, but if you want your brain to get stronger, you do have to make it exercise. Um, so one way to do this is explore things that you don't really understand. In this class, I keep saying the discussion questions are open ended. The exam questions are open ended. There is no right or wrong answer. What that means is 
you don't have to worry about getting something 100% right or wrong. As long as you learn something, as long as you understand something better than earlier, that's a good thing. Your brain is growing. OK, not growing. Your brain will not get bigger, but your, your brain is getting stronger. And oftentimes this kind of learning can feel hopeless, can feel like despair and drewong. It can feel like you're stuck in the same place and you're never going to understand this thing. But that is the darkness before the dawn. When I was in college, I studied Latin, Latingu, which is in some ways much harder than English. In English, uh, third person pronouns, he, she, it, uh, him, her, they, them. What is it like 10 words in Latin? Third person pronouns. You have 36 choices. Uh, and I had to know all of them and I had to know when to use which one. I had to know how to put them in a sentence. So, you know, even for somebody as smart as myself, it was a challenge. What our Latin teacher used to do, uh, he used a textbook uh, of course, every unit had exercise questions, right? Practice. So he would make us do the Latin to English translations every week. But he would save the English to Latin translations for every four weeks. So every week we learn something new and we practice translating Latin to English, Latin to English. And then every four weeks, Suddenly he would say, OK, now let's do the other direction, English to Latin. We hated it. It was terrible. Our English was, of course, better than our Latin. So when we tried to translate English to Latin, it was full of mistakes. It was full of nonsense. And the teacher wanted us to go to the front to write down our answers on the board. And then he, uh, he would ask somebody else to come and correct it. God, so embarrassing. But. Uh, when we were preparing for the exams and we were going back through the old questions, we found something strange. All of those really hard English to Latin questions suddenly seemed easy. All of the mistakes that we used to make were suddenly so obvious. How could we not see it? How could we get this wrong? And it's because over time, we were learning. Our brains were getting stronger. It just didn't feel like it because every week we were facing something new. It's like if you go to the gym and every week you try to lift something heavier and heavier and heavier. Of course, it's going to feel like you're not improving. But after four weeks, if you go back to the first thing you tried to lift, it will suddenly feel very light. So that's what's happening what I hope will happen for you in this class. When you first try to read the thing, it will feel like it's impossible. It will feel like it's torture. You're never going to understand it. But hopefully by the third week, you will get a sense of what's going on. You will kind of understand how the author uses the language. You will pick up some tricks to help you understand. And just as you think things are getting easier, we're going to switch to the next thing and it will feel hard again. And that's by design. By the time you prepare for the midterm exam and you go back, it should feel like you have. It should look familiar. You should know basically what's going on. Uh, some of you might even feel like the language is now very friendly and welcoming. Even if you don't understand all of it yet. Um, and then for the second half of the semester, Jane Austen was writing in the 19th century, late 19th century. So the language is much closer to uh, English today. But that presents a different set of problems. Yes, she will be using more familiar words, but the meaning of those words will not be exactly the same as the meanings that we use today. In translation theory, we call these false friends. Looks like something familiar. It's a trap. 
Um, so I'll warn you about this again when we get into the second half of the semester. Uh, but if something doesn't make sense, that is when you should go to a dictionary. And you should use an English to English dictionary, not English to Chinese, not ChatGPT, not Google Translate. If you use ChatGPT and Google Translate, it may not know the answer. If you use an English to Chinese dictionary, it may give you a newer meaning when you need an older meaning. But if you use an English to English dictionary, even online, it will tell you the current meaning, the slightly less common meaning, and then the older meaning. And the older meaning is usually what you will want for this class. Um, so that's a, one study tip. Another study tip is as you are reading, uh, of course, you should take notes about words and grammar, but you should also take notes as a summary. Like when you're reading a play, after every scene, write down who is in this scene, what important things happened, what important information is in this scene. First of all, it will help you remember. When you write down a summary, you have to think about it, and that will help create a memory for you to remember. Secondly, when you write the summary, the physical act of writing has been shown to help you remember. This is why I print out the handouts and carry them here just for you. And this is why I encourage you to take pen and paper notes and not on your pad, not on your computer, on your tablet, on your laptop. Literally, studies have shown people who type their notes remember less. Um, so as you read, take notes about key points as well as the language. And the third benefit of doing this is that when you go back and you prepare for the exam, you don't have to read the whole thing. You can just read your summaries, and when you get to a part that you need more detail for, then you can read that part, but you don't have to read the whole thing again. I think I forgot something in the middle of that. Um, oh yes, okay. Speaking about like how hard learning is, um, another study has shown that um, it compared two kinds of teaching. One is lecture, like right now, I'm lecturing you, right? I'm giving you information. The other kind of teaching is group work, which we're going to do starting next week. Right, you give a question to some students, they come together, they talk about it, they come up with an answer. The study showed that students felt like they were learning more from the lecture. And when they were in group discussions, it felt like they were stuck in place, they didn't really learn anything. But the students who learned by lecture got a lower exam score than the students who learned by group work. Even though it feels like they were not learning, they actually learned more. And this is the same reason why uh, difficulty is not a problem. It's a challenge. Only when you face difficulty are you really learning. Only when you are climbing does it feel hard. What really happened was the students who were listening to the lecture they felt like they understood more because they know what a lecture is. They know uh, the teacher is supposed to present a new idea, explain the idea, give some examples. It's a very familiar structure. It feels familiar. But feeling familiar and learning something are two different things. This is also why when you study, the worst way to study is to reread your notes, just sitting there and rereading your notes. What you're really doing is you're chasing the feeling of familiarity. It feels familiar. You know these notes, you took these notes, but it doesn't mean that you learn these notes. The best way to learn is to grab your roommate, 
give them a set of questions and have them ask you to test you. Only when you can produce the answers do you really know what you are supposed to learn. Um, learning, you know, it's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be fun in the same way watching a movie is fun. Learning can be fun. If you like to go mountain climbing, if you like to go to the gym, if you like to solve puzzles, those are also hard work, but they can be fun. Learning is the same thing. Uh, I think I forgot something else. <laughs> I also need to exercise my brain. OK, I, that's about it. If I think of it later, I'll tell you. Um, so that's why I decided to keep these really hard things for you to read. Uh, I chose texts that are, of course, important, right? The class is called uh, British Important Writers Works. It has to be important. But that's not really the point, right? We're reading three things out of, what was it? Uh, 1,500 years of British literature. We're reading three things. So you can see that the point is not uh, you learn about all the important British writers. That's what we were supposed to do last semester. This semester is giving you a chance to really dive deep into something from a different period, a different culture, a different language almost. And to experience that cultural gap and the connection between cultures. Uh, and it helps that we're studying good literature. Uh, but having said that, I have been trying to change what I teach for this course, um, mainly because uh, I don't know if you know this, but I'm not actually an expert in British literature. I'm an expert in American literature. And so I also teach American literature class. If you want to take that class, uh, that is in the fall semester. And we have a lot of fun in that class. Sorry, I have a lot of fun in that class. Um, but it has fallen to me to teach you this course, and so I chose things that I thought could be quite interesting to read and think about. Um, I have been trying to find things that are more modern, closer to today to teach. I have not found anything, and it's my problem. I don't like British literature. I think I don't enjoy anything written from the UK after 1980. Um, so if you want uh, this class to teach something simpler, you have to get the department to hire another person. Sorry about that. Um, so we're going to read some classic stuff. OK, that is the psychological preparation. Questions? OK, so let's talk about this thing. John Ford's Tis Pity She's a Whore. Uh, there is no Chinese version. There is a movie, but it's in Italian and there's no Chinese subtitles. Um, but if you want to watch it anyways, you can try to find it. Actually, I have a copy. It's too long. It's over two hours. We don't have time to watch it in class. But if you want to watch it anyways, let me know. I'll share my movie with you. And it's also it's not very uh, similar to the play. There are many changes. Anyway, lots of reasons, no movie. So no Chinese, no movie. But there has been a performance in Chinese. Uh, I think a, a, like a decade ago, some actors translated it and performed it in like the National Theater or something. And they translated the title as which is a literal translation. Tis pity she's a whore. Um, the word whore today is an insult. Um, the, the definition of this word is a sex worker, xin gong zuo but it's an insult. Uh, and at the time, however, that's not what it meant. In those days, the word whore just meant a loose woman, a woman who did not follow the social rules and expectations. So uh, when the title says, tis pity she's a whore, it's not saying that she likes to have lots of sex. Although it is also saying she likes like, have, like to have lots of sex. The point is, it's calling her somebody who doesn't follow the social rules. What kind of social rules does she break? 
Well, I'm glad you asked. This class, uh, reading this play, I think could be quite fun because this play is about brother sister incest. Luan Luan. Uh, like brother and sister fall in love, they they get married in secret, but because she's a woman in this period, her father wants to get her married to somebody else. So she has to choose between her brother, who is her secret lover, or some other idiot who she doesn't like, uh, but is a noble and it has a good background, and uh, her father likes him also. And it's a tragedy, Beiju. So of course you can guess the ending. I don't know. Can you guess the ending? Like, people die. That's pretty obvious. But the way that they die is kind of exciting. Uh, it, it's a very there. There is no other death on stage from a Renaissance English play quite like this death. Very very memorable death scene. We'll get to it in three weeks. Don't worry. Um, so as it says here, this play was first performed sometime around 1629 to 1633. We don't have an exact record of the date of the performance, uh, but we do know that it was published in 1633, so it must have been performed before that. Even today, even modern stage plays are first performed and then published. Um, the kind of stage play in that period. Um, OK, let's start from the beginning. Today we have TV, we have movies, we have video games. Back then they had plays. Plays were the popular art form. Anybody from a rich noble to a poor farmer, if they had one penny, they could go see a play. Um, the play houses usually had uh, three or four levels. The bottom level was just open ground. Then you had the first level, second level, third level. The higher the level, the more expensive the ticket. But it was the popular entertainment of the day. And so like today we think about a play, we think about a group of actors who take a play and they memorize it and then they perform the play eight times a week for like six months. That is not what happened in those days. In those days, a group of actors would perform like four different plays every week. And most of those plays would be new. Most plays were performed once, and if the audience didn't like it, they would throw away the play. So the plays that we do have are all pretty good because it means that it's good enough that the actors would perform it again and again. Usually more than three times was considered a very good play. And then after they were done performing, somebody was willing to pay to publish the, the, the play. Um, and that's how we have preserved this literature today. So like the bad ones, you, we sometimes have records of like bad reviews where somebody is like insulting the play, but we don't have the actual play. Uh, so the ones we do have are all pretty good. But you also have to remember that these are popular entertainments, kind of like soap operas, body and dumb, right? So violence, sex, betrayal, death, ghosts, witches, all of that stuff can happen on stage. But you can also have comedies, right? People falling around and like fake fighting each other and just having a good time being silly. Uh, Shakespeare even has a play with a bear, an actual bear uh, comes on stage and there's a stage direction that says uh, bear exit stage left and the bear was supposed to leave the stage. Um, so that's the kind of environment people were in when they went to see a play. Now, uh, by the time of the mid 17th century, so like early 17th century, mid 17th century, plays started to change due to economic factors, due to political factors. The government did not like uh, playhouses. They thought, first of all, uh, it's a place where everybody can come together. And so 
the lower classes can influence the higher classes or like uh, the the rebels and miscontents can influence the good citizens or like uh, sex workers can find more clients. Nobody like the people in power did not like the idea of different people mixing together in one place. Uh, that's a political reason, but there's also a public health reason. In this period, the biggest uh, disease, the most serious disease was the Black Plague, Hesebing. Uh, at that time, they did not know about germs. They did not know how people caught disease. They thought it was bad air and poor religion. So when people got sick, they would like uh, use incense and smoke and pray to God. And that's how they tried to heal sick people. Of course, it didn't work, right? Um, but at least they know, they knew that somehow if you put people together, more people get sick. So whenever the Black Death came to town, the government would shut down the playhouses. They would use it as an excuse to shut down the playhouses. Um, so uh, the playhouses of the day were facing these different pressures. The way that they responded is um, they asked for government protection. As I said, anybody could go see a play, even the queen and king. The people in power didn't like the fact that people were mixing together, but they did like to see plays. So if you put that together, what you get is uh, the people in power pick acting troops and playhouses, gives them money, protects them from like being closed down for different reasons. But in return, the actors have to uh, write and perform plays for their protector. Uh, we call these protectors patrons, Gu Zhu. Um, and so over time, the playhouses became less accessible for ordinary people. Um, the plays moved from outdoors to indoors. Instead of a round playhouse, now they had a rectangular square playhouse. It looks more like the stages that we have today. Now, from outdoors to indoors, this was a problem because this was before electricity. If you're outdoors, fine, a good day, sunny day, no problem. But if you're indoors and there are no windows or the windows are not big enough, how do you light the stage? With fire, but fire creates smoke. So you have to have ventilation. So instead of just like, picking a place to perform a play, they had to build new indoor playhouses. But once you move things indoors, you can actually use the lighting for special effects. Um, in an outdoor play, you also had fire, but the fire was kind of like a prop, right? It tells the audience, oh, now it's nighttime. But indoors, you can actually use the fire and use the light to control who you see and who you don't see, to control the audience's attention on different parts of the stage. Uh, you can create sound effects and lighting effects, thunder, lightning. When a ghost appears, you can make it actually look like a ghost. Um, so indoor plays like this one uh, start to have more special effects and they look more exciting on stage. OK, uh, let's take a short break. When we come back, I will talk more about the person and the actual story, and then we will get into the play.
Okay, so that was the introduction to the background of this play. Now let's talk about the author, John Ford. John Ford is a highly educated lawyer, and it was not uncommon for this kind of person to become a playwright. In order to write a play, it's not enough to know English and to know the story. Playwrights of that time often used stories from earlier literary works from other countries or from history. Um, so they had to have a kind of knowledge background and they had some most of the time they knew another language in addition to Latin and Greek. Uh, so like John Ford probably knew Italian. But we don't have too many details about his life. Even the most famous playwright, Shakespeare, there are large parts of his life we know nothing about. So it's not too surprising. What we do know is that his writing style is actually more like Shakespeare than like other popular playwrights of his day. In those days, again, this is a popular entertainment. So the emphasis is not always on the art. The emphasis is on letting people quickly understand what's going on and quickly feel emotionally connected to the story. So in those days, most playwrights didn't use three dimensional, fully developed characters. They used what we call character types. Dianxing. So you have like the hero and the villain and the mother and the nurse and the sister, right? These are types. They're not actual completely developed characters. But John Ford was different. He was more like Shakespeare. Shakespeare, of course, also uses types, but he gives them dialogue and he puts them in situations that make them feel like complete characters. John Ford does that for his main characters. In this case, the brother and sister and uh, the. The future husband is a little uh, almost complete, but like for the smaller characters, they are very obviously just types. So when we read a play like this, we shouldn't expect that all of the characters are completely human, let's say. Some of them are just fulfilling some kind of function or role in the story. Now, in addition to the characters and their lines, there will also be action, right? Stage business. Some people will fight. Some people will eavesdrop, toting. Uh, some people will do something with objects, with props, daoju. Um, so these are also things we can think about. What does it say on the page and what could it look like on the stage? OK, so uh, I took this version of the play from this book. Um, right, versions. OK, so it's published in 1633. Uh, for this play, we only have one source. Some plays, like Shakespeare plays, we have two sources, three sources, four sources, and every source will be different. So for a modern edition, the editor has to choose OK, if this is different, should I use this one or should I use that one or should I combine them or like maybe it's something completely different and they're all wrong in some way. And that's why you can find many different versions of Shakespeare in a bookstore. Each editor makes different decisions. For this play, we only have one source, but the editor still has a job to do. Because sometimes the source itself is not trustworthy. Maybe there is one part of the play that doesn't make sense. What does the editor do then? How does the editor make it make sense? The editor also has to decide what to do when it's not exactly clear which word John Ford is using. In those days, words were spelled differently. Sometimes words were spelled inconsistently. Same word, different people could spell it in different ways. So if there's a one word that 
people don't agree what word this is, then an editor has to decide to make it this word or that word. Uh, and then, of course, there's the issue of punctuation. In those days, punctuation is related to performance. A comma tells the actor to pause. A period tells the actor to stop. That kind of thing. It's not related to grammar. But today in English, the punctuation is more grammar and less performance. So how does the editor rearrange and change the punctuation to help us make sense of what the play is actually saying? Um, so like for this version of the play, I do admit there are one or two places where I don't agree with the editor, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but I chose this version because I found the PDF. Um, the other version that I like better, I could not find the PDF. I only had like a paper copy, and if I scan the paper copy, it becomes blurry and there's lots of notes and it's just very messy. So we're going to use the, the PDF. Uh, and the places that are kind of weird, we will talk about together as a learning experience. OK, so the first page is like the introduction by the editor. If you're interested, you can read this. It says uh, that the play is kind of similar to Romeo and Juliet. And it's true, there are some similarities. Of course, Romeo and Juliet were from two different families, not from the same family. Uh, and then the next page after the introduction, you have further reading. If you're interested, here are different editions by different editors. And then you have commentary, the research papers and reviews, things like that. Uh, here we have a textual note. So this is where the editor tells us which version of the play uh, is used to begin with. But of course, this play only has one version. Uh, you don't have this page. This is just even more uh, related uh, studies and literature. OK, and then the play begins. Tis pity she's a whore, 1633. In those days, as I said, uh, famous actors and playwrights had a patron. And so uh, at the beginning of the play, uh, the first part is a recommendation by, I guess, somebody famous that we don't remember today, Thomas Ellis. Um, if you go to a bookstore and you pick up a book, on the cover it will say, this is a great book, everybody should read this, by somebody famous. Same thing, um, except in those days, it, this took the form of a poem. We're going to skip the poem. Then you have a dedication. There are two kinds of dedications. One is you dedicate the play to your patron. They give you money, they protect you, you give them the play. The second kind of dedication is you have finished a new play and you hope that this person can become your patron. So you dedicate it to them and if they like the play, then maybe they will give you money and protection. This is the second kind. The uh, John Earl of Peterborough, Lord Mordaunt, Baron of Turvey, is not John Ford's patron. And it turns out, decided not to become John Ford's patron. But, you know, Ford tried. He tried his best. Um, after the dedication, you have a list of actors' names. Traditionally, you would first have the men and then you had the women, and then you had the servants and the unimportant people. Uh, so here, uh, Bonaventura is a friar, or uh, like a religious man, Sen si, Sen Lu, sorry. A cardinal, Dao Zhu Jiao, nuncio to the Pope, the Pope is a uh, Jiao Huang, the leader of the Catholic Church. Uh, a cardinal is like the second, OK, how do I explain this? This is the Catholic Church, right? Only the Catholic Church has a pope. The pope is chosen from among the cardinals. Like each time a pope dies, the cardinals come together and they vote to choose a new pope. So the pope is equal to the cardinals 
except he is their leader, but they're the same level. A nuncio is somebody who is very close to the Pope, somebody who gives the Pope advice, somebody the Pope talks to uh, on tough questions. In other words, this is a very important cardinal. Uh, we don't have his name. He's too important. Nobody would use his name. We all call him the cardinal. Uh, then you have Saranzo, a nobleman. Florio, a citizen of Parma. So the play takes place in the Italian uh, city of Parma. In those days, Italy was not a country. Italy was a peninsula full of city states. Uh, so Parma was an independent city. You have Donato, another citizen. Grimaldi, a Roman gentleman. Ah, so he's not just from a random city. He's from Rome. Uh, so he has slightly more uh, social power, I guess you could say. Giovanni, son to Florio, Brighetto, nephew to Donato, Richardetto, a supposed physician. Physician means doctor. Even today, uh, physician means doctor. But it says a supposed physician, like he's supposed to be a doctor. Does that mean he's not really a doctor? How fun. Vesquez, servant to Soranzo. Uh, Vesquez is a Spanish name. That could be important. Paggio, servant to Brighetto. Banditi, which means bandits, which means robbers. Huaitan. Officers, servants, etc. The unimportant people. And then you have the women. Annabella, daughter to Florio. OK, so we have a guy named Florio. We have his son Giovanni, and now we have his daughter Annabella. So those are the two that will fall in love. Hippolyta, wife to Richardetto, the supposed physician. Philotus, his niece. His means Richardetto. So Philotus is the niece of Richardetto. And you have Putana, tutris to Annabella. Okay, the word tutris. Do we have an explanation? No, OK. Tutris is the female version of tutor, jia jiao, tutor. But in those days, a tutor does not just teach you. A tutor also takes care of you. So it's kind of like uh, a babysitter and a tutor. Uh, in modern English, sorry, not modern, in like 19th century English, we would call this a governess. Um, in Shakespeare's plays, this character is called a nurse. But it's the same kind of job. Take care of somebody and teach them. Uh, and, and also she lives in the same house. And the scene is set in Parma. OK, and then the play begins. Act one, scene one. Uh, in these plays, most of the time, well, not most of the time, in earlier plays, the acts and the scenes were uh, divided by the editor, like the playwright didn't care. When Shakespeare, for example, wrote a new play, uh, he would first present it to his fellow actors, and if they agreed to use the play, they would uh, copy out the dialogue for different characters, and then they would add the last line before the dialogue and the first line after the dialogue. And so each actor would only have in their hands their own character's dialogue. They wouldn't really look at other people's dialogue. And so these documents are called parts or sides. We still use these words today. If you talk to an actor who goes to audition, they will receive something that is only related to their character, and they will say, these are my sides. Uh, what they would do is they would post the sides uh, backstage next to the stage entrance. And so the stage manager, they are listening to the play, they're looking at the sides, and they can like tell the actor, oh, you're up next, get ready. And the actor will look at the sides and when they see the last line of the previous section, they will go out and perform their part and come back in. So 
the division between acts and scenes was not that important. But this play is slightly later performed for nobles in an indoor theater, so they can't be so slapdash, but in a must be in. And it's also published, so somebody decided to divide it into these acts and these scenes. But you should know that for that audience, the division is not very important. Uh, in this kind of play, you have five acts. Uh, and the number of scenes depends on how many different locations you go to. Each time you shift to a different place or you shift to a different group of people, it's a new scene. Um, so if you look at, at the syllabus, next week you're supposed to read up to uh, starting from the beginning, right? Act one. And please finish up to act two, scene two. Uh, OK, so where is that? Act one, scene one. Act one, scene two. Blah, blah, blah. Act one, scene three. Act two, scene one. Act two, scene two. So please read up to here. This is. It's like 11 pages, 10 pages, 11 pages, not too hard. OK, so that's the homework. Uh, let's take a look at the actual play. The most important thing to know is how do you read the notes? Because there are notes. Look at the bottom, there are notes. Ta-da, notes. Uh, this version is prepared for students like yourself. So most of these notes are explaining vocabulary and uh, sometimes if the grammar is too hard the editor will translate for you uh, but you have to know how to use them the numbers on the left are line numbers hang shu so two means line two okay line one line two and it's school points so it's explaining this word school points and it says school points means topics for scholarly debate. In other words, it's an academic debate. It's only important in theory. It's not important in real life. So now we understand this word. We can see what this line means. Act one, scene one, enter Friar and Giovanni. Enter means these two characters go on stage. Friar, dispute no more in this. Dispute means argue. So don't argue about this. For means because. Even today, for can sometimes mean because. No, young man, you must know. These are no school points. Uh, and the editor told us school points are empty scholarly debate. So he's saying these are not just empty scholarly debates. So he's saying this is serious. It's real life. Stop arguing about this. It's real. Nice philosophy may tolerate unlikely arguments. Do we have a note? Uh, no, OK, so nice means uh, careful. It's a bad word. Uh, in Chinese, we say that's what nice means. Too careful. Uh, in English, in modern English, we say splitting hairs, which means like uh, you cut uh, through the middle of a long piece of hair vertically. So like it's very small details. Sorry. So nice philosophy. So like if you're really doing careful philosophy, may tolerate unlikely arguments. But heaven admits no jest. So if you're doing philosophy, you can talk about these empty academic debates, but heaven, which means God, does not let you joke about these things. Jest means to joke. 
Uh, even today we use this word. Uh, also a, a related word, jester means a clown or a joker. Not this word, jester. Not gesture, jester. Okay, J-E-S-T-E-R. Jester. There we go. Uh, OK, uh, we have a note for admit. Allow. So heaven admits no jest means heaven will not let you joke about this. At this point, you can probably guess what they're talking about, right? I told you the story, the main story of the play. Uh, the friar says God will not let you do this. It's very likely Giovanni just told him I love my sister. Romantically. OK, heaven admits no jest. Wits that presumed on wit too much by striving how to prove there was no God. Uh, OK. So wit today, wit is like uh, if someone is witty, that means they have a fast reaction and they're funny. Jizi. Wit originally just means intelligence or a smart person. So smart people that presumed on wit too much, who depended on their own intelligence too much. So they were trying to be too smart. By striving how to prove there was no God. So trying too hard to be smart by trying to argue that God does not exist with foolish grounds of art and the note tells us art means learning so the way that they argue that there's no god is by using what they have learned in a foolish way ground means basis the word basis today has the same root base which means foundation jichu right even in the chinese the original meaning of the word is a like a foundation for a building. Base, basis, ground. Uh, in, in philosophy today, ground means reason or basic reason. So uh, people who try too hard to be smart use their learning to argue foolishly that God does not exist. Discovered first the nearest way to hell. So by doing this, they opened up their own way to hell. And filled the world with devilish atheism. Atheism just means they don't believe God exists. So people who try too hard to be smart went to hell and made the world worse. Such questions, youth. Youth means young man. He's talking to Giovanni. Such questions, youth, are fond. Fond means foolish. It says in the bottom. Uh, so such questions are fond, are foolish. For better it is to bless the sun than reason why it shines. It is better to simply thank the sun than to ask why are you there? So it's talking about God. When it says sun, it's talking about God. Thank God, don't ask what do you really exist? Or like religion, thank the Lord you have religion, don't ask too many questions. Yet he thou talks of is above the sun. If you see a noun and it's capitalized for no reason, it's probably God. So the God that you, thou means you, talks of, uh, this is talkist, E-S-T, and it's the older form of I-N-G. So the God that you are talking about, he thou talkst of is above the sun. He's even more important than the sun. No more. I may not hear it, which means I will not hear it. Shut up. Don't tell me. Um, OK, so even from this first section, we can observe some things about the language. The structure is not too different. It's still mostly subject, verb, object, and then other stuff at the end. 
what's different is the vocabulary. But even here, you can still tell that it's the same language. The meanings are just kind of strange. Like. Uh, ground, right? Uh, there is a connection with reason, but it's very uncommon today. Or even the word art. The word art means skill or learning, learning skill. Today, if somebody is a very good worker, like a carpenter, or like a plumber, if they're very good, we call them an artisan, same root, art. Um, even words that seem like they have different meanings, right? The word fond. Today, to be fond of means to like or to enjoy. Um, but you can also like think about being if you really enjoy your dog and you play with your dog. Have you ever seen dog owners talk to their dogs? Like using that kind of baby pet voice saying stupid shit to their dogs. So there's a connection here. If you like something too much, you become a blabbering idiot about it. So Fawn's original meaning is foolish. Um, and you can even see the connection between thou and you, right? It both end in OU, both are used to refer to the other person. So it, the language looks very familiar. It's just slightly different. Uh, or this word, tis. Tis just means it is. Uh, this is the same word in the title, right? Tis pity she's a whore. It is. Um, or we say it's. We just omit the other letter. Right today we skip the second I in the past they skipped the first I, but it's the same two words. It is. Um, and so like the apostrophe, if you see the apostrophe, it means that some letters, maybe one letter, maybe more letters are being skipped. So you can see, you know, there's a little challenge, but it's not too hard. The harder part comes because they're talking about religion and philosophy. That part you have to think about. Giovanni, gentle father, father here in the sense of priest, Sun Fu. To be a friar or to be a monk, you have to have the same uh, religious authority as a priest. They're on the same level. So Giovanni calls him a priest, a father. Sun Fu. I just said that. Okay. Gentle father, to you I have unclasped my burdened soul. Unclasp means unlock. We still use the word clasp today in two different places. If you like hold your hands together, you can say that you clasp your hands. The other place is if you have like a purse where it it, it closes with a click. You know what I'm talking? Not the zipper, not a button, but like two things that kind of click together. That's a clasp. Um, but the original meaning is a lock. So to you, I have unlocked my burdened soul. My soul has a burden, you're a and I have given you my burden. I have shared it with you. So he's saying, I've shared my secret with you, basically. Emptied the storehouse of my thoughts. Store does not mean where something uh, somewhere to buy things. Store comes from storage, chu chang jian. Storehouses where you keep things. Empty the storehouse of my thoughts, and I made myself poor of secrets. So I have few secrets left. Why? Because I have given them to you. So it's like a creative use of language. I have not left another word untold, which hath not spoke all what I ever durst. So I have told you, I, okay, I have not told you something which has not spoken all that I ever dared to say. So a few words, right? Hath means has. 
spoke here is actually in past participle pp di san tai spoken uh what today would be a mistake but in those days uh they could do this this means that it's a relative pronoun guan dai ever means always even today ever means always uh, but today we only use ever in the negative sense or like in a question. Have you ever? Which means in all of your experience, have you done this before? But originally it means always. Durst it means dare, dangan, D-A-R-E. So I have not told you something that I have not always dared to say. So I have told you everything I dare to tell you. Or dare to think or dare to know. I've told you everything. And yet is here the comfort I shall have? Must I not do what all men else may love? So I shared my secret with you. But the only comfort you can tell me is to stop talking about it. Does that mean that I cannot do what everyone else can, which is to love? And the friar says, yes, you may love, fair son. And Giovanni keeps going. Must I not praise that beauty, which if framed anew? So if we start all over and we have a completely new person, the gods would make a god of if they had it there and kneel to it as I do kneel to them. So the person who's so beautiful that if the gods started over, they would make her a god and they would kneel to her and worship her because she is so beautiful. Must I not praise her? Can I not say that she's beautiful? And here the friar again starts to object. Why foolish madman? Why is not a question? Why is an interjection? It's expressing his emotion. Uh, people still used to say this in the 20th century. Uh, but for some reason, we have stopped using these words, which is a pity. These are very colorful words. Um, so here the friar calls Giovanni a madman, a foolish madman, because, of course, Giovanni is talking about a person so beautiful they could become a god. But they are in a Christian society. Uh, so he's bordering on being sacrilegious. Uh, OK, notice the line breaks. Like, most of these lines are complete, right? But here, the line stops here, and the next line it continues from the same place. This is because this play is written mostly in verse as poetry. We call this blank verse. If you remember from British uh, introduction to British literature, the sonnets were also written uh, in a similar meter. The, but the sonnets had rhymes. Blank verse does not rhyme. But the meter is the same. Uh, for example, this line. Another word untold which hath not spoke. Dun 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 dun. Uh, every dun dun is one foot. And there are five of them. Another word untold which hath not spoke. Five of them. Uh, so this is blank verse. It's the most popular and common kind of English poetry because if you listen to somebody speaking English, you'll realize that many people speak using blank verse or something similar. Listen to me talk. When I am speaking English, it sounds quite similar to blank verse. Um, it's not exactly the same because, of course, in daily life, language has differences and variations. But it's close enough that the poet can write a play in blank verse and it will sound like everyday speech. 
the bigger question is why does it have to be poetry? Why can't they just write it like uh, prose, Sanwen Ti? And it goes back to actors. As I said, actors perform four or five pl different plays every week. They have to memorize a lot of stuff. It's easy to forget. So making it poetry can help the actor remember. If they're in the middle of a dialogue and they forget what they are supposed to say, they remember the idea and they know where they are in the poetry, they can kind of guess what they're supposed to say. So even when they forget, they can figure it out and get through the rest of the scene. So back to this weird line break. Why are the lines like this? Because this is one line of poetry. Yes, you may love, fair son, must I not praise. One line. So when you're counting the lines, right? On the right, you have the line numbers, 21, 30, etc. This counts as one line. Uh, it's divided between two people, but it's it's counted as one line. Um, some some playwrights like to have fun with this. In Romeo and Juliet, when Romeo and Juliet first meet and they have a dialogue saying sweet nothings of love to each other. Shakespeare does something very interesting. If you put together Romeo's lines and Juliet's lines and you put them together, they form a love sonnet. And he can only do that if you count the two different uh, people talking on the same line. Uh, OK, so why foolish madman? And then Giovanni keeps going on about uh, how it shouldn't matter that she's my sister. Shall a peevish sound, and the note tells us peevish means trifling, petty, or in other words, unimportant. Should a, shall a peevish sound a customary form, so a conventional form, not meaningful, just a habit. From man to man of brother and of sister. So just because I call her a sister, just because she calls me a brother. Should that be a bar or something to prevent? Uh, twixt my perpetual happiness and me. Twixt, uh, I don't know if you can see this. There is an apostrophe here. In the very front. Twixt, the full word is betwixt. That's one word. Uh, and it means between. So should it be a bar between my perpetual happiness and me? Perpetual means forever. So this question is saying just because uh, everybody agrees that I should call her sister and she should call me brother, does that mean I can never be happy? And then he goes on to give a really stupid argument about this. Say that we had one father, say one womb, cursed to my joys, gave both us life and birth. Uh, when he mentions one womb, he thinks that's a terrible thing because it's the reason why they are brother and sister. And so it's what's preventing him from being happy. So when he mentions one womb, he's like, damn it, cursed to my joys. Uh, womb is, of course, where babies grow, right? Like a zigong. So let's say that we had one father, one womb. Are we not therefore each to other bound so much the more by nature? So because we share the same father, the same mother, doesn't that mean we belong to each other even more? by the links of blood, of reason. So we already share a bloodline, right? We belong together. Uh, and because of this reason, we should be together. Nay, which means no. If you will have it, so if you agree, even of religion, so even being tied together to the same religion, 
to be ever one, one soul, one flesh, which means body, one love, one heart, one all. God damn, this guy is very romantic. He just is aiming his romance at the wrong person. Uh, and so, of course, you know, this is bullshit. It sounds logical, uh, but it, it's completely wrong. So the friar says, have done, which means shut up. Unhappy youth, for thou art lost. Lost means you're going to hell. Like your soul has been lost to God. You're going to hell. Uh, so that's what's going on in this scene. Uh, I'm going to let you go early today, but before I stop, I want to introduce some other things that will be happening in this play. Uh, so we have brother sister incest. We talked about how their father wants Annabella to marry somebody else. Uh, that guy is an idiot. But there are also so many other characters, right? And this is because Annabella is on the market. So there's not just one person who wants to marry her. There are three people. And because uh, Florio, their father, is a rich man. So like these three men are all struggling to win Annabella's hand in marriage. And by struggle, sometimes I mean fight. Sometimes I mean murder, assassinate, betrayal, planning, treachery. Um, and so that's why there are so many other characters. They're all pursuing Annabella and they're all fighting each other. And, <laughs> and then there's another character who has nothing to do with Annabella, but he hates one of Annabella's suitors, one of the men who wants to marry Annabella. So he, he's fighting the guy who's trying to uh, woo Annabella. And then this guy also has a secret with, anyway, it gets kind of complicated. It's very like a soap opera. And the only way to make sense of everything is to slowly read through the whole play and take notes as you read. Um, so I'm going to stop here, but please finish up to the end of uh, Act 2, Scene 2. Questions so far? OK, so like I hope this guidance kind of shows you uh, how you can approach this play, what kind of strategies you can use, uh, or how you can think about uh, the language and the ideas. OK, see you guys next week.